All right. Um, today we're going to talk about web accessibility. And um, in, in the context of uh, web development, when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about making our website be able to be accessed by people with different abilities and disabilities. There are accommodations that take place just in the real physical world for people with disabilities. All right? And likewise, there are accommodations in uh, the web that we can do um, to uh, put in um, and, and help people access the content. Um, making something accessible usually consists of two pieces. And we'll talk about real world things first and then we'll talk about web things. It consists of, first of all, assistive technology. And second of all, and I'm not sure how to spell this, reasonable accommodations. All right. In the real world, what's an example of some assistive technology that someone who has a disability might use? Okay, that's a good that's a good example um, of of something on the internet. Let, uh, I'm focusing on real world. I mean, if you just look around on campus, what are some things? You know, there are people with disabilities. What are, what are some pieces of technology? And again, don't think computers when I say technology. Think of anything that assists someone in a wheelchair. Okay, they do have uh, people in a wheelchair have a button. And then there's automatic doors for people so that they have a button so that they can press it and, and open a door. All right? That's actually a mix of reasonable accommodations and assistive technology. The technology is a button and the wheelchair. The accommodation is the fact that we put that automatic opening thing on the doors. All right? And usually there's a switch on the doors, too, that you can, you can hit and you can open up the door that way. All right? Um, What's another example of assistive technology? Doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, ramps. ramps, all right, that would be an example. Again, we're kind of blurring the lines. You could either consider that a technology or you consider that an accommodation that we make. If you look, hate to, <laughs> hate to point someone out, but walking down the hall in a second, I think, unless they, they ducked into that lab, you'll see a person on crutches. Right? Crutches are assistive technology, again. So assistive technology is anything that someone with a disability uses to get around or to, to uh, accommodate. A white cane is an example of assistive technology. All right? Reasonable accommodations, then, are things such as having a ramp, having an elevator, all right? um, having outside of the classroom, on many of the classrooms, braille so that someone that can't see can actually feel and get the number. All right? So it's those two things working together that make a place physically accessible. All right? Um, people need the assistive technology, but if, for example, we had no wheelchair ramps on campus and we had no elevators, then you could have a wheelchair, but you'd still be very limited in what you can do. So the two things go hand in hand. Um, the assistive technology sort of assists people. Well, that's why they call it assistive technology, right? But it, it sort of levels the playing field a little bit. And the accommodations, again, makes it a little more even. Now, here's an interesting thing. 
Is there ever a time where assistive technology, can you think of in a physical building, um, can be used by someone who isn't disabled? The elevator. When would someone use an elevator? All right, if they're too lazy to go up the stairs, that's true. What would be another reason other than just laziness? Okay, they don't like to go up the stairs. <laughs> All right, what would be another reason? Pardon me? Okay, I thought you were saying afraid. I was going to say, isn't that the same thing as, uh, but yeah, afraid. In other words, you know, you are making a delivery of a desk up to the second floor, right? You don't want to carry the desk up the steps. I wouldn't think so anyhow. Or, even if it isn't freight, if I have my bag with me, you know, sometimes in my bag there'll be a lot of stuff. My laptop, uh, um, mobile devices, and who knows whatever, uh, books, and who knows whatever other stuff. And that could be heavy. Now, I'll tell you, I had about um, a year and a half ago, I had a hip injury. So I wouldn't call myself disabled, but going up steps sometimes is difficult for me, especially if I'm carrying something heavy. So if you see me using the elevator, it's not because I'm lazy, all right? Or it's not because I don't want to use the steps. It might be that I'm carrying something heavy that day, or maybe that particular day my hip, you know, is, is bugging me or, or whatever, all right? <laughs> I know. Well, the, the only thing I would say is, is you have to be careful because you never know. I mean, it's possible that they had, had, had an injury. It's possible they had, uh, uh, that they were up late with their sick baby and are feeling especially tired that day. So I, I know what you mean. But I would also not judge, because you never know where someone's coming from. Now, um, again, we, we can think of analogies for real-world accommodations all day. Wheelchair ramps. Well, what about people that have those backpacks that are on wheels, or whatever you call them? You know? They might want to go up a, a ramp instead of going upstairs. It's easier for them. Now, Braille on the door. Would a person that can see ever use Braille on the door to find their room number? Probably not. That's extremely unlikely. But does it interfere with you finding the room number? No. You just ignore it. You might not even know it's there. I mean, I don't know. Is there Braille outside our door? There's Braille outside of some of the doors. Let's check this one. Yeah, a lot of them there are. I'm not sure if this one is or not. Has a Braille. All right. So, you might not even realize that. You might, you know, the first day of class, you might have walked in, room 105, there it is. And I even noticed that there's little raised dots underneath it that would help people. So that's sort of the way that assistive technology, and, or that's sort of the way that reasonable accommodations work. All right. Reasonable accommodations work hand-in-hand hand with assistive technology, all right? They both work together. In other words, a wheelchair ramp and a wheelchair work together, all right? If you don't have the ramp, the wheelchair doesn't do you any good, all right? They can sometimes benefit even people who aren't technically disabled. In other words, someone that has a pushing a, an audiovisual cart or someone with a backpack on wheels, or whatever. They're not disabled, but the wheelchair ramp comes in handy for them in going up the steps. Or someone isn't disabled, but they're taking a desk up to the second floor. Or I'm not disabled, but I have an injury that sometimes makes it difficult if I'm carrying stuff, and therefore I'll use that. Um, so it can benefit people, even people that are not disabled. But, at the very least, it doesn't serve a hindrance to anyone else, like the Braille, all right? And we'll see that in the case of web development as well, all right? The reasonable accommodations we make on a web page work hand-in-hand -hand with the assistive technology. They can sometimes benefit even people without that particular disability. 
And at the very worst, they won't really bother anyone or won't really get in anyone's way. All right, let's think of some of the disabilities. You know, we, we can think of the disabilities that would make it difficult for someone to get around campus, right? If, if, they, you know, if they had a leg injury or if they have paralysis, you know, those are things that would hurt them getting around campus. What are some things that would hurt someone in accessing contact content on the web? Okay. Okay. Well, again, right now I just want to talk about the disabilities. And absolutely, probably the first one that comes to mind, because the web is so visual, are issues with vision. Of course, the most severe would be someone that's blind. All right? So someone that's blind, that's the most severe form of, of visual impairment. All right, and that would definitely affect the way that someone accesses the web. Can you imagine accessing the web if you can't see? That's difficult for a lot of people to imagine. Right? Um, now, David, you had mentioned some assistive technology um, for people that can't see, and, and what, would, what would that be? Right. Screen. screen readers take and essentially read or narrate the screen. Now, let's see if I can get this going here, because it doesn't always work as well as I want it to. But there's some of these things that are even built into Windows. All right. So if I go to Control Panel and look for Ease of Access Center, I can start the narrator, and the narrator reads the screen. Now, let me see. Probably also have to turn the volume up. Hmm. Let me open a window. Well, it's not cooperating with me today. But this is something you can try on your own machine. Go and turn on the narrator. And you can see, you can see the thing moving. Or maybe you can't. Show oh, desktop there we location go. Box. I didn't have the computer Desktop on. backslash all control panel items backslash ease of access center. Focus control panel. Locate control panel home hyperlink. Icon hyperlink. Change administrative settings hyperlink. Vertical location bar. Desktop backslash all control panel items backslash ease of access center. Focus on. Start on screen keyboard button. Okay, what it's doing essentially is it's reading the screen to us. It's reading back. Set up high contrast button. This window. Tool tip. Tool tip. Lorain County Community College, right. Home, Google Chrome Window, Focus On, Contains Chrome Legacy Window, Google Chrome. Let's tab around the page. Tab, 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 space, tab, tab. Now, 
This isn't doing a particularly good job. It isn't particularly useful. But keep in mind, this is like the bare bones one. And it is largely because I, I'm not terribly familiar with this. I'm sure that it can be used more effectively. And then in addition to this, there's other software as well that, that does a, 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 a better job for it. Um, but essentially what it does is it reads the screen to you. All right? And you go and if you tab through typically, I'm not sure the character in this one, but in many of them if you tab through, it takes you to the, each of the links and it reads the links to you. All right? So that's an example of assistive technology. I did a fellowship at NASA the one summer and there was a high school sophomore or junior who was blind and um, she would, I would come in late as, as usual and um, she would already be sitting at, I, I shared an office with her and she would already be sitting at her desk sometimes with the lights off, with her monitor off and working away on the computer. It was amazing to see. You know, it's like, how can someone do that? But the screen narrator read the screen to her, and she was able to do it. And you might think it's difficult, but if you have to do it, you're going to do it, right? If you have no other choice, you know? And she was able to do things that people her age typically do, you know? Um, make PowerPoint presentations, surf the web, chat with her friends instead of working, all right? All the things that you would expect a teenage intern to do on a job, all right? Uh, on occasion, she'd call me over to take a look at something on her screen if the screen reader was confusing to her and I would explain to her what was going on. But it was really amazing to see that. Now, let's think of, if you can imagine the screen being read to you and if you can imagine using the tab to navigate between links on a page, what's something that you as a web designer could do to either make that easier or make it harder. You're tabbing between the links and it's reading you the text of the links. What's something you could do to make that person's life easier or make it harder? Okay, there are some of those attributes, but with links specifically, it gets even simpler than that. In other words, what's a better link from an accessibility perspective? And I'm going to underline the text that's a link, all right? Which of those is a better link, number one or number two? From an accessibility perspective. You can imagine tabbing through and it reading the text of the link to you. The first one, what's it going to read to you? It's going to read click here. All right. What does that tell you about the link? Next to nothing. All right. The second one, it says news page. Well, if you tab over that and the screen reader reads you the contents of the link, it's going to say news page. Well, there you have an idea about what you're getting. So instead of having text that simply says click here or link or something like that, use descriptive text in your link. All right? Say, this is the news page. Even if I made the whole thing a link here, click here for news, that would be better than uh, just having click here being the link part. So make your link text descriptive so that if a screen reader is parsing through it, it's clear what that link points to. All right? Simple, huh? Makes sense, right? Well, again, you need to be aware of that so that you don't accidentally think that, well, it's pretty clever to say click here and make that the link. Or the one thing I noticed is um, 
like in some of your assignments, um, you had to define a good and a bad web page. You know, some people had something like example one, example two. Well, that's not terribly meaningful. But if you said, example of a good web page, apple.com is your link. Then that tells a person who's accessing it via a screen reader exactly which page you're going to, what you're getting, wh where you're going to. Or in the very first assignment, we had to come up with resources about a variety of topics. Instead of resource one, you could say W3 schools HTML reference. And that's much more meaningful for someone. Now, that's going to help someone who's visually impaired, right? Because as you tab through it, it's going to read the text of the link. Is that going to help someone or hurt someone who isn't visually impaired? Well, I would argue it would help them as well, right? Because I might not remember if I visited example one or example two, but I might remember if I've been to Apple's page or Google's page. So that little bit additional information uh, can actually help me remember, gee, I've already been to this site, all right? Or I have already visited the W3 schools reference for HTML. Let me try one of the other ones, all right? At the very least, it's not going to matter much, all right? And that's sort of the way that it goes with the web, like we said in real life, that the assistive technology, the things that you do, the reasonable accommodations that you make for people with disabilities, oftentimes help people without those disabilities, all right? And at the very least, doesn't really make much of a difference. Now, what, what are some of the other things that you can do? David mentioned some of them. There's some additional tags that, or attributes that you can put on tags. For example, you can put on an image an alt attribute. And the alt attribute at least explains what the image is and why it's there. Now, there's nothing you can do to describe an image to a person <clears throat> who's visually impaired that's going to make them, give them as good of experience as seeing the image. But at the very least, you can say, this is our company's logo. It's a link to our home page in the alt attribute, for example. That way, as they're going through, it will read the alt attribute, the screen reader will, and it will help them um, do that, uh, access that. Questions about this? Now, with visual impairment, we mentioned that there is sort of the most severe instance of it would be someone that is totally blind. But there's a whole range of people who aren't blind but have some degree of visual impairment. All right? There are people who are extremely, have extremely poor vision. There's people with cataracts. There's people um, that uh, are colorblind. All right? There's people who are simply getting older and are experiencing difficulty reading, especially small print. All right? So these are all things that we can think of when we go to accommodate it. So just like I'm not handicapped, but I have a, an injury, I'm not blind, yet I don't see particularly well. So things like making the font a certain size can be helpful. Or, better yet, making sure the font is resizable using the M. You know, 1.2 EM instead of saying 12 pixels or something like that can be beneficial uh, to someone. What about people that are colorblind? What can we do for people that are colorblind? First of all, what does it mean to say that someone is colorblind? Does that mean that they see in black and white? Yeah. Actually, there's a whole range of things that are classified as colorblind. There are people that can't see color. Um, but in many cases, it's simply a case of they can't distinguish between a couple colors. All right, red-green color blindness is, is one example. 
Um, there's actually some, there's actually a page or a number of pages where we can go and we can visit Well, this shows us how we would see an image. Well, Here's a little app that does that. See, there's a number of abilities. I'm not finding the one that I am in particular looking for. One thing we could definitely do is I could take a screenshot of a page and upload it as an image there, as an image. So let's go to lorraineccc.edu. There are some tools that allow you to simply put in a URL and it will test it. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a screenshot. So I'm going to go save that as lccc.jpg. And now I can go here and I can upload that. And that's what it looks like if I have normal color vision. If I have red green or red blindness, my page looks like that. If I have green blindness, my page looks like that. Ah. So red blindness looks like that. If I'm seeing monochromatic, that means essentially black and white. It just looks gray, the, the type. If I have um, blue blindness, page looks like that, and so on. So, as we run through this, we notice that of course it's not going to look the same for people that are colorblind, right? But at the very least, we can still read everything on the page. So that's a positive. So you would pick co colors that have a high degree of contrast, and then you can run some sort of testing for this. All right? There's another thing that you can do to help people with colorblindness, and that is 
don't only use color to indicate some special meaning. Remember when we talked about CSS, we said that we can use color to sort of designate that things are different. All right? So if I had an important news alert on my home page, all right, one thing I might do is make it in red font. All right? That way it will stand out, uh, you know, assuming the rest of the font on the page is, is black or some other color. Someone that's colorblind, though, someone that's red colorblind isn't going to see it. They're just going to see it as gray, and they may not be able to distinguish between that and the black font. So what else could we do besides making it red to designate that this news story is an important breaking news story, besides making it red? Yeah. You could, you could do anything else, right? Anything else that's different, right? So you could put it in italics. You could put it in bigger font. You could put a border around it. You could um, use a different font. You could position it with white space around it. You can use any of the other visual means that we have that you can show emphasis. The point is, is I wouldn't only want to use color. Or I could make it bold for example. That would be a second way. That way, someone who is not colorblind will see both of the visual cues. They'll see that it's red, and they'll see that it's bold or italics or whatever. Someone who is colorblind will at least see the one visual cue. All right? So, as far as color goes for the guidelines, um, make sure there's sufficient contrast between the colors, and use things other than color to show some specific meaning. Now, we can sort of distill all the principles of making a sensible into two or three principles. One is clarity. Second is multiple presentation. And the third is allow for user choice. Clarity, another word for clarity is simplicity. We didn't really get to demonstrate the screen reader, but as you can imagine, if there's a lot of stuff on the page, the screen reader is going to be very difficult to follow, just like it would be for someone who was reading a page that was cluttered. All right? So a cluttered page isn't going to work well whether you're accessing it visually or whether you're accessing it through a screen reader. So keep things simple, and that'll help. What do I mean by multiple presentation? Multiple presentation means showing the same content or the meaning in two different ways. For example, what well, we just talked about the breaking news story. We show it as a different color, but we also show it using a different font. We show it as a different color, but we also put it in italics. All right? So taking the same thing that we want to show, whether it be content or the way it looks, and representing that two different ways. Then, of course, if you could put user choice in there, that really helps things as well. So if you can easily make the font bigger or easily change the color scheme, then that can be very useful as well for people that are visually impaired and for people that um, are colorblind. You know, if you're colorblind, you can pick a color scheme that looks better for you. All right? So, let's kind of summarize what we have to this point. All right? Assistive technology and reasonable accommodations go hand in hand. The technology is used, again, in the first examples of screen reader that we talked about. 
There are other things. There are Braille displays uh, for, for computers. There are any number of other sorts of assistive technologies. But in order to truly take advantage of those, there needs to be reasonable accommodations taken. Disabilities can either be severe or milder. A lot of times people, even people that should know better, when you talk about accessibility, they think that you're only talking about people that are blind, right? Because that's sort of the most dramatic sort of disability that's going to impact someone's ability to use the web. But there's a whole range of other stuff. Besides blind, there's people that are colorblind. Besides blind, there are people that simply have poor vision. All right? All these things are milder degrees of a particular disability, but they can also have a big impact on the way the person accesses the web. All right? What we do for people with a disability is either going to help someone that doesn't have that disability, or at the least is going to be harmless. So, if we put the breaking news story red and in italics, hey, someone that can see, someone that's not colorblind and can see, all right, that doesn't, that doesn't mean, they're not going to look at it and say, oh, it's red and in italics, I guess it's not important then. Right? It's going to be doubly emphasized for them. Finally, the notion of clarity, which is sort of a good principle in general for web design. Who wants a cluttered, confusing page, regardless of your abilities or disabilities? And secondly, multiple presentation. That is showing the same stuff more than one way. All right. What I'd like to do, and we'll go for this for uh, the next five minutes or so to, to finish out this class, and then we'll probably finish this up on Monday, is carry through and look at some other disabilities besides the, the obvious visual ones. All right? What's another disability that would impact someone's ability to get content on a website besides visual impairment? All right, people that can't use their hands for some reason. All right, um, and what could what could be the reason for that? They could have certain neurological disorders, um, cerebral palsy, for example. Um, they could have arthritis. All right, um, they could have repetitive stress injury, carpal tunnel, where people that do the same thing over and over with their hand sometimes they develop something where it becomes very painful uh, to do that. And then I suppose that all the way goes down to um, someone who is completely paralyzed. All right? Now, what can we do for people that have any of these sorts of disabilities? What are some things that we could do? Either in terms of assistive technology or reasonable accommodations. Yes. Right, they use, they use their eyes, in other words, based on where their focus is. You know, um, I'm not sure if that's the kind of technology that Stephen Hawking uses. He may actually move something with his mouth. That's a very extreme form of it. But again, you know, if that's what you have to do, you know, you'll make it work. So using the eyes as focus would be one if someone was completely paralyzed. What's another thing that could be done if someone is completely paralyzed? <coughs> voice recognition, where you could issue commands via the voice. You know, I mean, tablets now, both Android and um, phones and tablets, mobile devices, um, actually, you know, take advantage of that with Siri for the Apple and whatever Google thing is called. Yeah, I might be. I, I kind of lose track of those. But being able to issue a command without having to touch, you know, that. And that's beneficial. 
as beneficial for someone who is paralyzed. But paralyzed people aren't the only people who use Siri. Who would be another person that would use Siri on their iPhone? Well, if you're driving and you want to call someone, you don't want to take your hands off the wheel, which is always a good idea. Keep your hands on the wheel when you're driving. All right. So you could use assistive technology then. All right. That would be another example. Or just for the convenience factor, right? You know, I mean, to go and click around, you know, it's like how impatient people get these days, you know. Um, you know, when it takes two minutes to heat up my, my microwave burrito, I'm like sitting there like, this is taking forever, right? Uh, so to open up your iPhone and to click on this and to click on that, you know, people want instant results, all right? What about people with milder cases of that? They don't necessarily have full paralysis, but they may have arthritis or they may have um, neurological issues that makes it hard to control. Um, another one would be something like Parkinson's where they have shaking hands. That, that might make it more difficult to use a mouse. What are some things that you could do on a web page to help those folks out? Yeah, size. Don't make the links too tiny. All right? Make the links able to be um, clicked on easily. And especially when we talk about mobile, that becomes really important, right? Because there's another class that you wouldn't count as a disability, but it sure makes my life difficult. People with big fingers, <laughs> all right? When I go and try to click a link on a web page, sometimes I click, click three links or I cl you know, click one of three. Whereas if they were bigger enough and there was enough space between them, that would become easier. So making the links physically bigger, not making them too small. Um, what would be another way that we could do that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And the question was something to the effect of, let me try to paraphrase it. Um, in accommodating people with disabilities, does that mean that we limit ourselves to not doing things that disabled people can't do. In other words, let's say, good example, let's say I wanted to do a simulation via an animation. All right? You know, simulate um, some process. All right? That might require the user using a mouse to navigate through things. What would be something to simulate? I don't know. Um, Simulate some sort of process showing what happens when you pull the rods in a nuclear power plant, for example. All right. I don't know why I picked that one, but you know, I tend to think of science when I think of simulations. But you know, that might require putting your mouse and dragging and doing this and all that. Well, what would you? What would you? Um, would you then not do that because there's some people that can't navigate the mouse? My answer would be no. Um, but you should make accommodations for them, and that accommodations might be providing that experience in a different way. Let me give you a for instance. Let's say I have my nuclear power plant simulation, and it's interactive so that people can go and click on things and see things that happen. All right? Obviously, someone that can't use a mouse can't use that simulation. So what, could, what, would there, what is something that we could do to provide those folks an alternate experience. Maybe not as good, right? Just like an alt attribute on an image can't describe to a blind person completely what they're missing. 
But what's something that we could do, do to give someone that experience or that information? Okay. You could, I guess what I was thinking of is you could, you could have, in this particular case, you could have a video of someone else running the simulation and saying, when I do this, this happens. When I do that, that happens. So it wouldn't be a case of duplicating the experience because if someone has a certain disability, you can't, no matter what you do programming-wise, you can't completely compensate for that. However, by using the idea of multiple presentations, you can provide a substitute experience that does that at least makes an effort. Again, the idea is reasonable accommodation. All right? So I wouldn't take something out of my site that was truly beneficial for most people simply because some people wouldn't use it. But the challenge would be to think of a different way to present that, to explain, you know, um, to, to explain it in, in greater detail. All right? So I, I think that's reasonable. You know, again, the key word in there is reasonable. Um, if you made no effort whatsoever, if you said, this simulation requires the use of a mouse, if you can't use a mouse, that's tough. That's not reasonable. You didn't even try. <laughs> All right. Whereas if you had, for example, a little video, or like David said, a slideshow, or something like that, that would get the same content across, all right, maybe not as completely or thoroughly or fun or effectively, but at least it would give some sort of, of way of expressing that content. Um, the, the answer, uh, yeah, uh, the answer to that is, you know, if I was designing this page, and let's say I had my nuclear simulation and I had a video of it, um, you could be very upfront and say, interactive, mouse-driven simulation, video of simulation. And it would be pretty clear that if you couldn't use a mouse, go and view the video. Um, whatever verbiage that you have, when in doubt, just be honest. If you can't use a mouse, click here. Or, oh, that would be horrible, right? If you can't use a mouse, click here. I'd have slapped myself for that one. Select this link. So how would you select the link if you can't click, by the way? Using the keyboard. And you could use keyboard shortcuts to make it that. Or on any web page, you can tab through the links and hit space and it'll take you to that page. So if I could not use a mouse, if I could at least use a keyboard, I could tab through and select it. All right. It's a great question, though. And that's the objection you hear for a lot of people that don't want to make the effort to make their site accessible, is that, well, we don't want to, quote, dumb down, end quote, our site to accommodate that. And I don't think it's an either or case. It's not like having interesting rich content or making your site accessible. It's figuring out a way to accommodate people so that they can see and access and, and benefit from all the content on your site. And if that means making a second version of something, you know, then so be it. It's a great, great, great question. Uh, I, you know, I've had students that said something like, you know, I had one student in particular that was very, very outspoken, and he was like, well, what you're telling me is never put a video on my site because there's some people that can't see it. And it's like, never said that at all, right? I can't, you can't make, 
You can't do anything to make a blind person see a video, but you can provide the same content in a different way. You know, make sure the, the video has good audio. Or something that we haven't talked about yet, a deaf person. Well, you could have captions on it or provide a transcript of it. That's all we're asking is, is be reasonable and try something to accommodate people that can access it. Exactly. Exactly. Other questions or comments? All right, we'll pick up on this and wrap it up on Monday. I'm trying to think. Monday will be the start of week 11, right? Your design is due next week sometime. So please bring any questions you have or email me any questions you have about the design assignment, the design for your project. Um, I think, if memory serves, after accessibility, we have three more big topics. Forms, tables, and JavaScript, I think. I'll have to review my notes, but I'm pretty sure that's what we have left. That sounds about right. That sounds about like five works, five weeks worth of stuff. All right. Um, all right. We'll see you up in lab.